Arlene Cummings is a, a, a Rumburunga Nullican woman born in central Arnhem Land and a member of the uh, Nullican clan of traditional owners of the Roper River region, region. She's a member of the Stolen Generation, having been taken as a young girl from her mother to live on the mission at Croker Island. She was the first Indigenous person to qualify as a preschool teacher in the Northern Territory. Uh, but she spent most of her career in both research and policy development, focusing on issues around family violence, Indigenous community services and education. Uh, in the 2000s, Eileen initiated and coordinated the Strong Family, Strong Community, Strong Future program, an Indigenous-designed, Indigenous staff program which provided training and support for people in remote communities to support families at risk in their own communities. She's widely known for humanitarian work and respected by Indigenous women and communities across the territory. She's received the NT Women's Achievement for Services Award uh, for the community and also the 2010 NT NADOC Award for an Indigenous Unsung Hero. She's a mother of three, grandmother of 10, and great-grandmother of three, she's been busy, uh, and continues to be active in research and advocacy, although her focus has been shifting to supporting the development of a new generation of Indigenous researchers and evaluators. In 2013, with very little notice, she ran as a candidate for the House of Representatives in the federal seat of Solomon for the Australian First Nations Political Party. Uh, please join me in welcoming Associate Professor Eileen Cummings. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's been really, I've thought and thought about this for a long time because um, with all the work I've done over the years on domestic violence and everything else, um, I really wanted to focus on our children. Um, so this paper is more to do with the old ways and the cultural well-being of our children and particularly in the, I'm, I'm speaking from the Northern Territory, nowhere else really. So, um, what I'd like to say today is to acknowledge and show respect to the elders in past and present of the Wurundjeri, Win, Winnerung and Wathurung peoples of the Kulin people of the Sle, on which we meet today. I thank Dr. Thomson uh, director of the Australian Institute of Criminology for inviting me to talk today and to share my Aboriginal culture and look forward to sharing experiences. My paper sort of covers the cultural well-being of uh, the Aboriginal teachings to create a better future for our children. I'm just a little bit nervous, so just give me time. <laughs> Too often we hear truth is a moral obligation and justice is a legal right. And we forget the moral obligations and com commitment that Aboriginal parents, families and communities have for their children's upbringing and nurturing. We talk about the insensitive and wanton legislations that promised, and I'm talking about the intervention in the Northern Territory, and a better and improved way of life and an opportunity to First Nations children of Australia. Instead, the First Nations peoples are often deemed to be misfits of society which is a, a fallacy, entrapped in such economic isolation without a personal identity. But of course, we have, a, have an identity and we often uh, void of our rights to the Land Rights Act and to the land, land of our, our ancestors. I believe the concept of shared responsibilities to tackle the serious social problems of abuse and domestic violence rest on the shoulders of all governments and, and in particular, the Aboriginal communities. Um, we, th because I believe that children are the silent sufferers affected by family violence and social abuse, and often this is experienced every, every day of their lives. And as I said before, I'm talking about the Northern Territory, I'm not talking about any other state or territory. This is the behavior that they see often and children will play out what they see and hear because to them, learning is their way by seeing and hearing things. That's the old way of teaching our children. Now children too often no longer learn from the Aboriginal way of learning things in their communities. Children have seen continuous um, social problems in their communities and 
What has become of the children's role models and their teachers in Aboriginal ways, cultural and spiritual learning? Too often today they are caught up in the wrong examples of behaviour and this is something that we have to start concentrating on. Learning in the Aboriginal way has always been by seeing, hearing and listening so it is easy for children to behave in this way if they continually see it on a uh, regular basis. But let me remind you all that there is strength and resilience in the Aboriginal culture and traditional governance to which family violence and abuse can be dealt with in partnership with Aboriginal parents, families and communities. Prevention and dealing with social issues has to be in partnership with the Aboriginal people because governments can't do it alone and the people have to be part of that process. I would like to talk about this great system within the Aboriginal families, clans and communities that we too often tend to neglect when working with Aboriginal people. It is important to work closely with traditional elders, families and communities to foster Aboriginal culture and traditional governance in which domestic violence is prohibited. In the Aboriginal way of life, their systems include Aboriginal children at all aspects of their upbringing. Children are part of their community, their cultural and spiritual learning and customs. The parents, elders and extended family ensure children's roles and responsibilities within the system is taught nurtured and adhered to in all family and community life. A lot of people don't talk about those sort of things, but it is true that um, when you are brought up in the right system within your own clans and your own communities, it is better for you to learn from your parents. A place for meetings in the past was always the campfire, and we placed a lot of emphasis on that because we did ceremonies there, we did conflict resolutions, uh, we resolving, we did singing, dancing, cooking, storytelling and spiritual teachings. For generations, Aboriginal people have gathered around these many campfires in many Aboriginal countries and children from very early age are taught about their roles and responsibilities within their clans and within their family. Children learn their place in ceremony the importance of these ceremonies and their cultural and spiritual obligation and how to behave while attending these important activities. They understand you don't question business in ceremony and cultural and spiritual systems. They do what is required of them as part of their role in the clan and group. This system of sending children away from their families and communities for education, medical and other services has played a big part in the interruption of the true teachings of customs in which children are raised. Nationally, Aboriginal children are more likely to be placed in out-of-home care than other children. Many parents are disempowered by this and ever increasingly social dysfunction and have not been empowered to reinstate the system which is once a strong and viable way of life for Aboriginal people. Children have always been loved, respected, nurtured and taught in the Aboriginal way. It is important that these values and systems are encouraged and that Aboriginal people are empowered to ensure the systems are once again taught to their children to bring back pride and dignity to the Aboriginal people and communities. Too often, the focus is wholly on the negative and not the positive. Their values and of Aboriginal child rearing and the Aboriginal practices which give young people their identity, their values, their role and purpose in life. So that's why it's so important that children are nurtured within that first part of their um, life in this way. If this is removed and children are placed outside of the system, they lose all sense of identity. Over and over we fear that a key factor in family resilience and child safety was the strength of traditional culture in that community and the per performance of those ceremonies. Aboriginal traditions have provided opportunities for children and young people to learn through ceremonies and about their cultural roles and responsibilities in ways that also help them to understand 
their responsibilities in life and their role in the wider world they live in. When people in communities practice their tradition and still maintain this respected system, families are stronger and children's cultural knowledge grows and they are, sa they are safer. You will find where traditional ceremonies and community events were struggling, families struggle, also struggled and children were increasingly at risk. In the history of the First Nations people, the traditional ceremonies and practices which were used over thousands of years to successfully socialise the children have often been neglected and ignored. Instead, children are being removed from their families, culture and country in numbers that are higher today even than they were in the days of the stolen generation. We know that the removal of children in previous generations has caused many problems associated with current issues today. And yet the pattern continues today in ever even greater numbers. What then is the hope for the next generation? Why governments not put more resources into family support and working with communities to strengthen them to support their children instead of putting such a high proportion of funding and staff into child removal. The practice of, of child removal started in the early 1900s when the Native Ordinance Act was in place. Children removed lost mother, family language, land culture, child rearing and nurturing, which meant many lost years that can never be replaced. And I speak from experience. Also, there is a high representation within welfare and the criminal justice system, and youth suicide rates are ever increasing. Children who are already in care have very poor or non-existent case management in many cases, and this is morally wrong. Children lose their cultural values and Aboriginal parents' support and face intergenerational harm because of the institutionalisation and out of a home care. Many of our mothers were forbidden when we were removed to even have any contact with us. And I never saw my mother till I was 19. <coughs> Excuse me a minute. I would like to share just a little thing about my uncle, who something that was said to me when I first left the mission that I was removed to as a four-year-old child and looking for my family later on in life. You can see from this what the old people felt about removal of children and see the way we, so many children became lost and isolated from their families, customs and culture. Many years ago an old man, my uncle, from my clan once said to me, my girl, if, you, if all your children had been allowed to stay with us, family, clan and community, you would have learnt everything about your country, the Aboriginal law side, ceremony side, kinship and your roles within your clan. This separation of children caused some, no learning and no knowledge to your spiritual and cultural her heritage as an Aboriginal child. Children have to be taught and cured, cared for in their own way to follow Blackfellow law as they became lost and lost forever. That was something my uncle said to me. I was so moved by this and realised the hurt of past policies to my mother, family and community. The realisation of the importance of us growing up within our family groups and learning our ways showed me how much we had lost, not only us, but our families and our communities. Uh, First Nations people, particularly the mothers, were not able to cope with the pain of losing their children. They could not to this day even discuss this because of the immense pain and grief and anguish. Their rights and nurturing practices as parents for their children were taken away from them. And how were their children to learn about their Aboriginal life without the proper teachings and nurturing? 
The Aboriginal people still feel this and need to be able to nurture their children in the right way from baby to teens because that's the most important part of their time as learning and understanding their own way. When children reach their teens, they're then young women and men in the eyes of the Aboriginal law and the elders. So that first part of their growing up is so important for them to have that nurturing from within their own people, people's country. Research internationally in removal of Aboriginal children has indicated the effects of removal of Aboriginal children was, was, an, was dehumanising and the environment in which the children were moved and the way they were raised was not the way of the Aboriginal nurturing practices. Children had no access to Aboriginal culture and society and the government often attacked the very fabric of Aboriginal culture and society. Institutionalised and out of home care children, not only in the stolen generation group, suffered trauma, dislocation, despair and suffered enorm enormous depression, lacked self-esteem and were deprived of intimate family relationship. Many of these children experienced indescribable social problems and found it difficult to integrate in society. I'll just um, tell you something that my daughter said to me when she was about 25. She said, Mum, um, you know, you're a better grandmother than you were ever a mother. And that hurt me a bit. But <laughs> then I realised what she was trying to say. She was saying, you never, the way you cuddle and play with your grandchildren is quite different to the way you played with me. And I said, I thought I was a good mother. <laughs> and she said, you were, Mum, but you never showed those feelings that you now show to your grannies. And I think that was because I was put that through that system where we never saw our mothers, we never had that upbringing that was part of our upbringing that I should have been part of. Yet I remember my grandfather actually carrying me through our country when I was about two or three years old, but I never ever saw him again. So those are the things that often, if you are going to take children and look after them in some other system, don't forget about their Aboriginal culture and the way that people rear their children because that's the most important thing to that child is they become lost. So when I said this, when my daughter said that to me, I was a little bit hurt because I thought I was a good mother and uh, she, she just reminded me how much we, I'd lost by not being with my mother till I was 19 years old. Um, so I thought I'd just let you know about that little part. With the abuse and violence in communities, people often in the past dealt with overwhelming problems by making it a smaller issue, not a big one, because they don't really want to concentrate on that. Now they want to be part of the solutions, and I think it's the best way to do this, to allow families to grow up their children, yet at the same time allow government agencies to assist in this process, working in partnership because it's so important that they have that first part of their nurturing. I'm almost finished. <laughs> a real uh, determination remains among many Aboriginal families, clans and communities to have great control in matters over which they have the greatest knowledge and respect of, their, of raising and nurturing their children. First Nations parents and families need to take control over their families as, as too many have been disallowed this control and have lost the will to free themselves from such control as growing concerns emerge every day. When I finally met up with my mother, she said, my girl, I don't know why they took you. My mother worked in the stock, stock camps. She knew how to uh, uh, muster cattle, rope them. She did all that work like any other man. And um, she worked in the station house where I was born and uh, no I wasn't actually born there I was born on the banks of the Minoroo River 
and I was actually delivered by Aboriginal grandmother. So I never was born in a hospital. And she said, I, I thought I did the right thing. I thought I did everything for you. And I was a happy child. I really loved being on the, at my um, cattle station where my mother worked, yet they took me away from her. And as I said, I never saw her again till I was 19. Um, it's taught me a lot. It's helped me through the years to really understand my families and my communities because of the pain and the anguish they've gone through. But I think it's made me stronger. Um, government should encourage the setting up of uh, cultural workshops to m promote educational en enterprises, both as empowering projects and possible employment outlets. By taking a multi pronged approach, services could enhance the community's involvement in the government's attempt to tackle the issues in a holistic way. From a bottom up rather than from a top down approach. I'd rather you work from here and up so that you can see where they're coming from. But we believe that our employment is a critical issue. Today as many First Nations people find it difficult to get uh, jobs. Numerous research has been conducted over the roles of Aboriginal people, particularly in the Ranger program, in education programs up home, in the family violence um, and safe houses program, where people are actually working and working for their community. So I believe that education is a real issue and I really want our people to have more of that rather than less because you'll find that we have uh, fast, safer communities and well-adjusted children. Having good community legal education both at communities and school levels is important too because to inform the people and children of the relevant legal frameworks that are available to them and allowing families to understand the legal schemes in place. As Aboriginal beliefs in the con uh, context of Aboriginal culture, customary law and traditional governance forbids any forms of violence and abuse. But of course we know it still happens. The governments and Aboriginal people need to be responsible for children's safety and together need to find the best ways of doing this and do it in a way that helps those children build their own strong families in the future and, and socialise their, their children successfully. No culture can survive if its children are unable to carry it on. So I think it's really important that we try and carry this on. And all people in numerous discussions over the years and at international levels shows that vital role of culture in healing and building resilience is so important. It is time to act now and government and Aboriginal people have to work together to break the cycle of family breakdown to give Aboriginal children a safe and productive life. The new way forward is to allow parents and Aboriginal carers to teach their children the Aboriginal way to enable children to learn in their way within their own environment and the clan systems within the child rearing practices. I hope I have been able to share the importance of Aboriginal children's roles, their learning and why children have to be part of their clans families and communities to enable them to grow into strong Aboriginal adults. Each child has a role and responsibility within their family and groups. Many children have suffered abuse, neglect and experienced violence within their communities. Let us begin the healing process and grow a strong Aboriginal uh, community and stop the social dysfunction in our communities. This has to be done by First Nations people and families in partnership with government and agencies. And the new way forward is working together, both government and Aboriginal people as one voice and have, because they both can have the capacity and capability to ensure a good, healthy way forward for our children. Thank you. <laughs>